Well, it's hard to believe we're almost at the end of our series on Revelation. The final message will be next week. We've been gone through some pretty rough terrain since we started this series uh, way back in January of 2017. If any of you remember that. And uh, we're now to the last two chapters. We're looking today at Revelation 21 and next week at, at chapter 22. And these two chapters together, I don't want you to miss the, the point of them. The point is that the day is coming when all of God's intentions for humankind are going to be realized. They're going to be achieved you know, at the very beginning of the book of Genesis, we see God with this great plan for the earth and the great plan for humanity. And because of sin, because of the choice that we have made to disobey Him, it, it all became blurred, it all became warped, it all became twisted. And the whole story from Genesis on is God's attempt to bring us back into relationship with Him. And finally, in Revelation 21 and 22, we see it realized. Now understand, the victory was won in Calvary when Jesus died upon the cross. The victory was won then. But it will be fully realized when Jesus returns. And so today we're going to look at Revelation 21. And he opens up this way, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. And I want you to make note of that word new. That the day is coming when all things will be made new. The day is coming when all things shall be made as God intended. They shall all be new. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. Now I had a person say to me once, he said, I don't like that verse. There's nothing I like more than going to, to the beach and looking out over the ocean and seeing the sun rise. She said, am I not going to be able to enjoy that in heaven? And understand, again, that revelation is symbolic language. And in the symbolism of revelation, the sea was considered the abode of the beast. It was where the beast dwelled. And so when it says there was no longer any sea, it means that all evil has been done away with, has been obliterated, has been cast into the burning river. In verse 2, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully adorned for her husband. Now notice, as I said last week, the new Jerusalem is both a city and the bride of Christ. Both images are used in Revelation. So in one sense, the new Jerusalem is you and me as believers, the bride of Christ, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, and you know who's on the throne, and I love this verse, look, God's dwelling is place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. Reminds me at the very beginning of Genesis, we're told that God was walking in the garden in the cool of the morning, and he was seeking fellowship with his creation. But because of sin, they, Adam and Eve were hiding themselves. But once again, God is walking among his people. The relationship, the unity between God and ourselves that was broken by sin has now been restored completely. It was restored on Calvary 
when Jesus died, but it's fully realized when he returns. God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. And I treasure these verses, these next verses. I use them at almost every funeral that I do. And in light of the tragedies that our Christian community has endured over the last couple weeks, they are precious to us. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And there shall be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things have passed away. Anybody want to say amen? See, the clocks have gone ahead. I just need to know you're awake. But what, what verse is to treasure? What verse is to hold near to our spirits and to our souls? And in verse 5, he goes on again. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. All the damage that sin has done, both to our lives and to our relationships and to the whole created order, will be restored. The ultimate victory belongs to God. I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down for these words are trustworthy and true. He tells John, I want you to record these things. I want you to make note of them. I want you to remember them. Because they will happen and they are trustworthy and they are true. Indeed, those words could be said of the entire word of God. It's trustworthy and it's true and we can stake our lives on what's written here. Verse 6, he said to me, it is done. Reminds me what Jesus said when he was hanging on the cross and the victory had been won and he cried out, it is finished. It's the same thought here. It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega. The beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water without cost. Can you remember someone in Scripture that Jesus offered to give water without cost to? The woman at the well, the Samaritan woman. She had been married five times and the man she was now living with was not her husband. Her life was a mess and he offered to give her water without cost. And and the the same thing is being offered to everyone. To the thirsty I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Those who are victorious will inherit all this and I will be their God and they will be my children. Now I will admit, verse 8, I used to rebel at. And I thought to myself, you know, we've put up with so much ugliness in Revelation. Now that we're into the beautiful part, why does he have to bring the ugly back into it again? But he throws in the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magical arts, the idolaters, and all liars. They will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. Why does he have to include that? I've I've often asked myself. And the answer is because John knows he is writing before this, this final second coming has happened. And he still cares about his people. He still wants those who have not responded to the call of Jesus to respond. And so one more time, he's issuing the clarion call. One more time, he's calling people to repentance. One more time, he's saying, there is a God who loves you. Respond to him. And even as he's writing of the new heaven and the new earth and the new Jerusalem, his heart and mind is still with those who have not responded. One of the seven angels, verse 9, 
who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues, came and said to me, Come, I will show you the bride, that's you and me, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the Spirit to a mountain great and high and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem. Notice what it says, coming down out of heaven from God. John is reminding us that all things are restored not by human effort, not by scientific achievement, not by what we struggle to do as human beings, but it comes down from God by His might, by His ability, by His strength, by His will. It all comes from God. It shone, verse 11, with the glory of God and its brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. And you know why it's clear as crystal? Because it's been washed in the blood of the Lamb. It had a great high wall with 12 gates and with 12 angels at the gates. On the gates were written the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. I want you to notice the next verse because it's hugely important. Very easy to miss the meaning here. There were three gates on the east, three on the north, three on the south, and three on the west. Now in ancient cities, gates usually faced in one direction. But here we have a city, the New Jerusalem, facing in four directions, north, south, east, and west. John is reminding us that people entering this new city, this new Jerusalem, will be coming from every language, culture, tribe, nation, and people. It goes right back to our vision statement, become a revelation church where people from all ethnicities are invited to be transformed by God. And that's what we see here. Every nation, every culture, every tribe, every color, every ethnicity, all coming together and gathering in this great city for the wedding banquet of the Lamb. Verse 14, the wall of the city had 12 foundations. And on them were the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. Very similar to what Paul says, by the way, in Ephesians chapter 2. Beginning at verse 19, Paul says to the Ephesians, Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers. Why were they foreigners and strangers? Because this world is not our home. We are citizens of the heavenly city, the new Jerusalem. But but he says, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household built on the, and there's the word again, foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. And notice the foundation is not simply the apostles, but it's the theological essentials of our faith. You know what those are? Those essentials that we stand or fall on. The, 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 our belief in one God. And in Jesus Christ, His only begotten Son. And in His death, on the cross, on our behalf. And our belief in the Scriptures as the inspired, infallible Word of God. These are the foundations that make us the people of God. And we're told that those theological beliefs, those those 12 apostles of what they stood for, are the foundations on which the city of God, the new Jerusalem, is built. The angel who talked with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city, its gates, and its walls. 
So he has a measuring rod and he's measuring it. We come to verse 16. I'm going to ask you a question here. And I was absolutely sure that no one in the bridge would be able to answer this question because I didn't know the answer to the question before I studied it. Of course, if I didn't know. <laughs> but the people being the people, Mary Jane Haley, Margaret Ryan, your daughter, knew the answer to this question. I see Paul just perked up. Get some sibling rivalry going on here. Here's my question. Verse 16 says, The city was laid out like a square as long as it was wide. The city was laid out like a square as long as it was wide. There's only one other structure in all the Bible that's described as being a square. I didn't know this. Does anyone know what that structure is that is described as being a square? Oh, Paul. The temple, you're, you're, you're in the ballpark. There you go. Yes. Within the temple, the very center of the temple is the Holy of Holies. I won't get into all this. We've heard it before. It's where the very presence of God was said to dwell. And pe the, the only one who entered the Holy of Holies in the Old Testament was the high priest. And he entered once a year to offer sacrifices on behalf of his people. It was in the shape of a square. And this city, this new Jerusalem, is also in the shape of a square. John is telling us that this ver the city where we shall live for eternity is where God himself shall dwell. It's as if we will spend eternity in the holy of holies. What an image. What an image. The city was laid out like a square as long as it was wide. He measured the city with the rod and found it to be 12,000 stadia in length and as wide and high as it is long. The angel measured the wall using human measurements and it was 144 cubits thick. Notice that the numbers that they give here are either the number 12 or a multiple of 12. In, in Revelation, 12 is the symbol for the people of God. 12 means the people of God. It also means the entirety of a group. And so John is telling us by these measurements that all the people of God will be dwelling within the new Jerusalem. And then he makes use of beautiful imagery. He's using earthly language to describe something beyond earthly language. He's trying to describe the most beautiful sights that he can imagine. So this is what he's doing here. The wall was made of jasper and the city of pure gold, as pure as glass. The foundations of the city, remember we talked about the foundations, were decorated with every kind of precious stone. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third agate, the fourth emerald, the fifth onyx, the sixth ruby, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth turquoise, the eleventh jacinth, and the twelfth amethyst. He's describing absolute beauty as best he can. The twelve gates were twelve pearls, each gate made of a single pearl. The great street of the city was of gold as pure as transparent glass. And I love verse 22. I did not see a temple in the city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. There's no temple. There's no church because God Almighty is within the whole of the city. You see, you and I, we make a mistake 
because we draw a line between the sacred and the secular. And we say that certain things belong to God and certain things belong to us. And we give God church and we give God prayer and we give God Bible reading and things like that. But the reminder is here that God is concerned and he cares about and he's involved in every part of our lives. So whether you're going to church or going to work, whether you're on your knees or walking in the park, whether you're exercising or going to a Bible study, whether you're going to a movie or going to to a worship time, all of those are areas of God's interest and concern. There is no area of life that God does not care about. There's no part of your life that he doesn't care about. If you're struggling financially, he cares. If you have family problems, he cares. If you're struggling with depression, he cares. Whatever you're going through, he cares. See, this is a make, make we need to understand, and I know you know this, but I, I want to remind you anyways, this is a beautiful building that we have here. But this is not a church. You and I are the church. And wherever we go, whatever we do, we are the church. If this building were to burn down tonight, God forbid, First Baptist Church would be alive and well tomorrow morning because this space is no more sacred than any other space because wherever we go, God is there and he is in the midst of us and we are the church. Never forget that. We are the church. And that is the message that we see all through Revelation. I did not see a temple in the city. You could say, I did not see a church in the city. Because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its church. Verse 23. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it. For the glory of God gives its light. And the Lamb is its lamp. Remember Jesus when he was on top of the Mount of Transfiguration and his face shone like the sun and his clothes were as white as lightning. That's what the whole city is like. And I love verse 24. The nations will walk by its light, by the light of the Lamb. You know, nations aren't doing that today, are they? Some do it a little better than others. Some a little better than others. But for the most part, the nations of the world are not walking by the lamp, by the lamp of the lamb. But the day is coming when they will. The nations will walk by its light and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. That is, the kings of the earth will offer everything they have and everything they are to God because they will recognize that he is the source of all that they have. And I love verse 25. On no day will its gates ever be shut. In ancient cities, gates were always shut at night for safety and security. But in the new Jerusalem, they will never be shut. It's a symbol of utter security, absolute safety. On no day will its gates ever be shut, for there will be no night there. The glory and honor of the nations will be brought into it. Nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful. Again, John's warning those who still have not submitted to Jesus Christ but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life and understand the invitation to have our names written in the book of life is given to all people. God's aim, his wish, his desire is to have no one 
outside of the New Jerusalem to have everyone's name written in the book. But he also respects our free will. I recently read someone said that in the fallen analysis, in the final analysis, there are two groups of people. There are those who say to God, Thy will be done. And there are those to whom God says, Thy will be done. No one is excluded from the new Jerusalem except those who exclude themselves, who refuse to submit to the Lamb. And the whole book of Revelation, in addition to encouraging persecuted believers, is to try to convince people to make a choice for God while they can still make the choice. You know, in a time when three young people connected with churches, connected with our Christian community, have passed away, tragically, we need the message of Revelation. We need to remember that when it's darkest, there is a dawn coming. As I've said so many times, the people that John was writing to were persecuted Christians struggling to hold on. And John, through writing this book, was saying to them, hold on, it's worth it. And that's what he says to us. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, as as Jeff prayed just a few moments ago, we continue to pray for those three families in our greater Christian community who have experienced the worst tragedies that any families can. And we pray that you would continue to offer to them the hope that is ours through Jesus Christ our Lord. And in the midst of our struggles, Lord, may we remember that no matter how dark the night gets, the dawn is coming when you shall wipe away all tears from our eyes. Thank you, Lord. Praise you. Hallelujah. Amen.